Yellow. I am on the line with the biggest superstar in Yankees universe, the Seminity source, Pete Seminity. How are you doing? I am doing well. How are you? Chilling, man. Um, let's get into some quick um, talk about the Yankees. Uh, what do you see the Yankees going when it comes to the bullpen? You know, the Yankees are going to uh, be a little, you know, use the uh, – to use the term save money so they're probably going to try new options where do you see the Yankees going well if when I when I put I put out a video a while ago kind of breaking down what I personally would do and I'm not a huge fan of throwing a lot of money at bullpen arms especially if you really want to improve your rotation the way the Yankees are saying they're going to do it uh, as we already know with Paxton coming over and, and likely, you know, uh, Corbin or somebody else. But um, if they're going after anybody, it looks like Adam Adovino is a name that they're very interested in. I know there's been reports about that being an offer. I haven't heard of an offer, um, but there's been reports about that. Andrew Miller has been linked. I don't see the Yankees giving Miller the money that he's likely going to get from a team like the Mets or a couple of other clubs who will probably overpay for him. I don't think Britain will come back. I think Britain will likely find a uh, closing role somewhere. But he, I think, is more likely, to be honest, than a few other guys because he really liked his time with the Yankees. He said that uh, there was a child care service that his family really loved, and that would definitely factor in his decision-making. So that could be a possibility. He also said he doesn't mind not being a closer. So I can see a couple of different ways the Yankees can go there. I mean, always think of trade possibilities also that could be out there on the horizon. Um, but then guys, too, that the Yankees already have, like a possibility of Tommy Canely, you know, finding his velocity again or maybe being fully healthy uh, could be a real force for him. Yeah, exactly. The Yankees really didn't have confidence in Canely last uh, season. Why do you think that's so? Um, because he lost um, velocity? Yeah, I think there probably was an injury or something going on there. Um no matter what it no matter what it necessarily was, you can tell that he just lost some velocity. And he was a guy who's typically typically hitting ninety six, ninety seven, ninety eight. You know, he was down ninety two, ninety one, and then he has a great changeup, but there's not a good mix there when he's not throwing ninety five, ninety six constantly. So that was the big problem with him. And his control has never been great, but last year was worse than it typically been over the last couple of years. With the bullpen, I think the Yankees are just going to uh, find their solutions via free agency because I don't see them trading for bullpen help because there's so many available uh, mm -hmm. relief pitchers via free agency. So I don't see the Yankees making a trade, but I do see the Yankees making a trade for an infielder. What do you think about the infield situation about the Yankees? Do you think the Yankees are going to trade for an infielder and then just call it quits for Machado? What, what do you see there? I think it depends. I mean, it really does depend on a lot of different things. You can see the Yankees are certainly doing their due diligence, but what uh, what I feel like a lot of people forget about is, you know, when they when they talked about Segura, it was basically along the lines of, you know, we only want to give up Sheffield for this type of deal and get Paxton too, or we'll add a few more to that. When it comes to Goldsmith, we're going to give up Sheffield. Well, who are they going to give up now? You know, who are, are the Yankees going to deal Floriel? We know they wouldn't give Floriel up to get Kluber or Carrasco. So are they going to give Floriel up to get a, a Segura or a Goldsmith? I don't, I don't see that happening. So why, do you think the Yankees, that the Yankees, um, why do you think the Yankees are going after a rental at, like Goldsmith? Well, I, I think, it, I think um, at the end of the day, let's, 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 when, it goes, when it talks about first base, let's think of something here. And I've said this a lot. Why are the Yankees, over the last couple of years, why have they been so comfortable with giving a rookie who hasn't proved anything or just uh, somebody, uh, basically I'm talking about Greg Bird, giving him a position with no competition? First base is important. I don't know where the Yankees have gotten away from having exactly. a pretty good first base. Yeah, historically for the New York Yankees, uh, the first base position has carried the Yankees to World oh, Series championships. No no doubt about it and, and that's my one concern is you know a lot of people talk about well Luke Voigt was great yeah but that's understandable but Luke Voigt shouldn't be given first base exactly. I don't care what Luke Voigt did I like Luke Voigt a lot not a great defender at all and again hopefully he is the guy we saw he he's is a maybe he could defender. Be a he's a horrible defender I think worse than no, no question no question and I want a first baseman I mean that's the way I see it and, and a lot of people say well you also want Murphy there 
Well, look, Murphy's been a guy who's played it. He's a left-handed hitter. I want Murphy in the Yankee lineup. I don't care about his defense. I want him in the lineup. He could be a DH of all I care. But the Yankees should get somebody, even if it's somebody in the late innings, where they know can play a good first base. But Goldsmith will be tremendous wherever he goes. I think it's going to cost a lot to get him, and I think Arizona's going to get that. So we know um, Jacoby Ellsbury's from the Oregon uh, state of Oregon. And uh, recently the Yankees or the Mariners contacted the Yankees and offered them a trade deal or whatever for Robinson Cano. Yeah. Uh, do you think Cano is still in play or you just think it was just a one-time deal or whatever? But um, what do you think about the Yankees also shopping Ellsbury? Well, yeah, I mean, I have a I have a video about that coming out that I that I recorded a little earlier that I'll put out basically just breaking down how the money would work. So I I looked at this and and if you if you talk about trading uh trading Ellsbury, what is the one thing that every Yankee fan does? Well, they look for the other big contract of another team to make it a swap. So with Cano, you got to think about it like this and and I'll I'll do a really quick breakdown of it. Cano's owed about $120 million over the next five years. Ellsbury's owed about 42 or 44 around there over yeah, two 42, years. 42, because 42. he has a buyout in his third year, $5 million, which you would count towards the salary. So you throw that all in there. Basically, the first two years are going to be a wash if this deal ever happens. So you're basically, the Yankees are getting production out of the money they're spending on Ellsbury, which they haven't gotten in two years. So that's fine. That'll make sense. What you look for if you're the Yankees on that type of deal what are the Mariners going to give you for the final three years of Cano? Would the Mariners give you $10 million a year so you're paying Cano maybe about $11 million for the final three years, $11 million a year? That's a deal maybe you're, you would consider the DH and will play him at first base the first two years. But do I think it's, a, it's, it's out of the realm of insanity? No, not at all. It, it makes sense in many in ways. In my but... opinion, as Cano gets older, I think his power is going to go up. I think he's very similar to like a David Ortiz if he's given a chance to DH. I think the power numbers would be there. But what do you think about that? Well, it's funny because, no, I actually talk about that on my video, and I had a different comparison for him. I like the David Ortiz, especially as a DH, no doubt yeah. about it. I kind of, I compared him, and I'm not comparing him to as the overall player. I'm comparing him with hand-eye coordination, a guy that's not really going to lose much of that. I compared him to, to, to Barry Bonds in a sense. Yeah. Um, he really has that excellent hand-eye coordination that guys don't lose. So I don't think he's ever going to be a guy that bats 230. I think Cano will always hit over 250, 265. And as a DH in his final couple of years, that can be productive. And who knows how good of a first baseman this guy could be. Do I think he'll be above average? I don't think so. I think he could be an average first baseman. Exactly. Um, he's and I played think, the um, right side of the I, infield his yeah. whole career. He, he has a good glove. He can feel the ball. Um, he still does it at second base. He doesn't have the range no more, but Cano's, Cano's still a very good defender. I think Cano's a sleeper, that he could make the all-star team one year, then have a subpar year the other year. But I think there's still years on him that I think he could be all-star caliber, in my opinion. I, I agree 100%. That, 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 to me, is the draw to Cano, is that this is not a guy who you kind of see as a guy who, yeah, I'm getting him older, but what type of older player is he? This isn't an out of shape guy, and I mean you can exactly. throw out all like you a, want. You could make similarities to Edgar Martinez, etc. The Cano is that kind of player. He has eye co coordination, his hands are good, and you know he'll produce at an older age. And look at the way he's played. This is a guy who plays. This is a guy who's not out. He exactly. doesn't get injured. Knock on wood. I mean he doesn't get hurt a lot. He doesn't miss games. He doesn't sit out games. I understand the suspension, and I, and I address that in my video I'm putting out. But again, like I said, if the Mariners made it work, which I don't think they really would do something like that, like ten, you know, thirty million for the final three years. But I wouldn't if I was Cashman. I'm talking about Ellsbury. I don't even care about the first two years because it's a wash. I care about what are you going to do those final three years when I'm paying them twenty four million. I don't want to do that. You yeah, at least got to um, pay ten million a year. Yeah, honestly, it sounds to me that uh, Cano is um, he's homesick and he reached out to the Mariners and said, hey, trade me to New York, because even the Mets are involved. Well, if you remember, we talked about this when this first went down. It was just a poor decision on his agent side. It was just a dumb move. I mean, they they presented Seattle as this up-and-coming team that's going to go ahead and get you to a World Series, and the Yankees are going to do the same thing, but this one's offering you more money. It was a poor choice, especially for a Dominican player 
that is so popular in New York City. Exactly. It was and, just and we a don't very know, exactly. bad choice. And we don't know the behind-the-scenes things of what um, the Mariners promised Cano, etc. So who knows whose hand mm -hmm. has the upper hand here? Oh, no doubt about it. I mean, I feel like I could almost speak on that. I guarantee you Cano was promised a team that's going to compete every year of that deal. And that's obviously not going to happen. Exactly. You know, um, what do you think about Corbin and this Japanese picture that the Yankees are eyeing, this left-handed picture from Japan? Do you think the Yankees prefer to sign him because he's worthless or what? What's your opinion? The only concern I have with the Yankees signing Patrick Corbin is Philadelphia. That's the only concern I have. Other than that, I think Patrick Corbin's a Yankee, and I, I can I can put my hands on fire to say that. I, I truly believe Patrick Corbin will be a Yankee. It's a match made in heaven in many ways. Patrick Corbin also reminds me of the guy that you you put his money where his mouth is, and you say, hey, look, here's the deal we're offering. I guarantee you you're probably going to get a bigger deal, but you want to play here, right? Play here. And I, I think, and I, and I talked about this a lot of times, I think you're going to see what guys like Corbin, with a guy like Harper or with a guy like Machado, whoever the Yankees sign, you're going to find out that there was much larger offers on the table, but they prefer to play for the Yankees. Exactly. You're it's kind of similar I, to I can, uh, Carl Pavano when he took that contract. A lot of guys. Pavano, Carlos Beltran. There was quite a few guys. Johnny Damon. There was quite a few guys that just wanted to play for the Yankees. And at the end of the day, you're going to be a multi-multi-millionaire and make a ton of money. So it's your choice at this point. And these guys have all said in one way or another – that they want to be Yankees. Well, you know, if I'm Brian Cashman, I'm, I'm in a sense putting that against them, going, look, we're making a competitive offer. We're not shortchanging you at all. But if you want to play here, here's the deal that works for us. Accept it or leave it. But and knowing, that's what I yeah. do think will – I think that will come down to it with a lot of these guys, that there'll be, there'll be an offer on the table, and it's not going to be there for long. And, look, you accept it or you don't. Simple exactly, as that. but um, waiting for that Japanese picture to post – do you think the Yankees are going to wait for him and see what his number is? And if the number is right, would you think the Yankees would prefer him over Corbin? I don't think, no, I, I don't think so. I think Corbin will still be the guy. I mean, he's the more known commodity. I mean, if you look at Patrick Corbin overall, people undervalue this guy so much. You know, I've had people tell me that, you know, you'd rather give Jay Happ three years or Keuchel three years you know, Patrick Corbin is only trending up. Like, people will tell you, well, it's been the one year. No, it's, it's, it's more of a body of work than that. And if you hear anybody talk about Corbin, the guy has the best slider in Major League Baseball. Go watch. You can do the eye test. You don't got to go by metrics and spin rate and all that crap. Go look at the eye test and watch this guy pitch. He's a bulldog. He challenges you. He'll go after you. He's the type of guy the Yankees need. He's a guy that will pitch these big games. Mark my words. He's not Sonny Gray. This is definitely not Sonny Gray, a guy that's going to fold in New York. He wants to be here. His grandparents are huge Yankee fans. His parents are Yankee fans. He comes from a long line of real Yankee love, and I, I do expect him to take less to come to the Yankees. So let's talk about free agency. I, for one, think the Yankees are just going to sign one, either Machado or Harper. But I think they're going to sign either two if they free salary space. So, I get back to the supposed rumor, but um, it's rumblings and chatter, of the original source of who predicted Stanton to New York. And it was a guy named uh, Nick Conforto, who has a great reputation. And now, fast forward, he is saying that the Yankees are going to look at the possibility of shipping out Stanton, preferably to the Los Angeles area. It could be the Angels, it could be the Dodgers. Do you see the Yankees trying to ship out uh, Stanton because they want to free up space to sign a Harper or Machado, or do you think that they're going to keep Stanton and sign a Harper or Machado? Yeah, well, let me um, let me start with Nick Carfardo because a lot of the things you hear about Nick is that Nick has been wrong, so on and so forth. Look, here's the deal. Everybody's wrong. I'm tired of this idea that Yankee fans or fans in general – feel like every single person that reports Yankee exactly. news or news in general is 100% right all the time. It's impossible. You're not going to be right all the time. There's deals that go through that end up something happens on the backside of it that they fall apart. So things like that happen. So to knock to knock Nick Carfardo's credibility to me is a bit ridiculous. Exactly. And to say he's a Boston, he's a Red Sox writer is even <laughs> more ridiculous exactly. because this happens all the time. You got people that follow 
the, the, the A's that break Yankee news, people hear things and they put the news out there. So it has nothing to do with what affiliation he's with or what team he reports on. That, that makes no sense at all. Exactly. But speaking of the whole Stanton thing, I could see it. Do I think it's likely? I don't see it as likely because I don't know how easy it is to make it work. Um, the only team that makes sense, in my opinion, is the Dodgers. Now, the Dodgers can do that. What would the Yankees want back? How would you make that deal work? How much of that money is going to be you know, taken from the Yankees? Are the Yankees going to pay more of it? Are the Yankees going to just hold on to it? Um, it? It's an odd one. It makes sense. It makes too much sense because he's from Los Angeles. He loves the Dodgers. He grew up being a Dodger fan. He has nothing to be connected in the New York City area. He hasn't even, let's say, if you're going to be signed to a team, even though you have two more years to opt out, you would think that you'll go house hunting, own something here in New York. So that's the kind of fishy aspect that I have. But continue with what you were going to say. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the whole thing with Stanton is I think Stanton will be better in his second year. I think there's there's always an adjustment period, and let's be let's be honest here. I mean, even myself, the the type of the type of production we were expecting from Stanton coming into a new league in American League East, which is a lot tougher division than the league he'd been beating up on for years. Here's why, though. It, it look, was, let me stop you real quick. Here's why I looked okay. worse for Stanton. His struggles. Judge made him look ridiculous. Judge. Oh, well, Judge is a better player. Exactly. I mean, that that's the way I see it. Judge, I honestly could. Exactly. With a weak wrist, Judge was taking just Stanton to the school. He showed everybody and their mother how Stanton is supposed to perform. And he did yeah. it with a weak wrist. He came in clutch in the situations mm-hmm. where he needed to be clutch. Stanton, he struck out. He was swinging at balls into the dirt. That's what made it look worse yeah. for uh, Stanton. If Judge wasn't on and, this team, it wouldn't have been an issue. Well, you know, you're, you're 100% spot on. And the thing we got to remember is, too, we don't know what goes in a player's mindset. You know, that comparison started before he was ever a Yankee. Exactly. There was comparisons between Aaron Judge and Stanton. They went to the home run derby. And, oh, my God, let's get pictures of these two together. Then he becomes a Yankee, and it's, well, who's going to have the better year? You know, and, and you don't know what goes in a guy's mindset. You don't know if that played on the Stanton. You, I don't think it played on the Judge. I think Judge is just Judge is just a rare guy. He's a he's a rare character. If for it baseball. proved any, yeah, if, it, if that proved anything, it showed everybody the mindset of Judge that nothing comes in between him and focusing on the game. Nothing and could distract him. Exactly, he's a winner. Exactly, that's right. That's a hundred percent right. But I mean, I don't know. We'll, we'll see, man. Um. It's something that, again, we, what we also got to remember is, too, nobody saw the Stanton deal really coming. I mean, this is something that really came out of nowhere. You don't know what type of – trust me, there's conversations of players that none of us would even believe is having a conversation about, and they happen. That's how this stuff works. Like, people make just me laugh like, when they go, uh, oh, that really and Cano, just like that. That sounds exactly. like a fake and, Twitter proposal, and like but it was about to my video. Brian Cashman said he was talking to the Mariners for over a month. So I guarantee you a lot of names came up. This could have been a 20-minute conversation, as all as we know. But it does make sense in a way that, you know, Cano's still productive. Ellsbury's not. I can see where it would make sense if you want to make it a wash. Cano at Yankee Stadium with his left-handed swing at Yankee Stadium. I guarantee you're going to get power from Cano. You're going to get clutch hits from Cano. He is an older player. With age comes, you know, brains, if you would say. I think if Cano comes back to the Yankees, he's going to be a productive player. Well, I think Robinson Cano is going to be, always be Robinson Cano. I mean, he's just one of those guys that is always going to be productive. Like I said before, I don't ever envision a season of Robinson Cano hitting 230. I just don't. I, I, I don't ever see that. He's just too good of a hitter overall. Um, to ever see something like that happen, but you know, when it comes to this, when it comes to Stanton overall, you know, we'll see. It'll have to be something you would think would have to happen, you know, probably by the middle of January, the latest or the first week of January, unless it likely won't happen, because you do got to make room then to your, for your other additions if you wanted to sign Harper and Machado. But I agree with you in the sense that I think the Yankees signed one of those guys. Uh, my preference has been Harper; it always will be Harper. Just yeah, because of the left-handed bat in the lineup, yeah. 
I think all roads lead sense. to our. It, it makes sense. It makes sense for the lefty bat. Now, I don't like the idea of him as a first baseman. I don't want to give a guy three hundred million dollars to 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 play a position he's never really played before. But we'll see what happens there. Machado makes a lot of sense because he also improves the Yankees' infield defense. Um, however they go about that, it, it makes both players make sense for the Yankees. And if this was the Yankees of old, you're likely looking at both of these guys being a Yankee, no question about it. Let's say, though, all these trades fell through for the Yankees. Let's say they got Paul Goldschmidt. Let's say they got a player like Gene Segura. Let's say they got a player, not Gene Segura, but Scooter Jeanette. That would be the Yankees right there said. They wouldn't even try to attempt to uh, sign Harper or Machado. But this is the signals well, at, at, that they have at put that out. Point, there will be, yeah, I mean, at that point, there will be no reason. I mean, I, I mean, I even I was even talking about, I think, either either in a live chat or somewhere when I mentioned the fact that if they're able to get Scooter Jeanette and you get this lefty bat that can hit, you know, 25 homers, he has two years in a row and 90-plus RBIs. Yeah, he plays in Cincinnati. I get it. But Yankee Stadium is, is, is definitely a bigger, better ballpark. Um, I mean, Cincinnati's a better ballpark to hit in than Yankee Stadium. But for a lefty hitter, Yankee Stadium's wonderful. And for a guy like Jeanette, if you add Jeanette, go out there and just and, and sign Corbin and sign two two relief pitchers. And, I mean, exactly. you're basically set at that point. Um, and, exactly. and build and the everything Yankees up have shown, there, but, Yeah, and the Yankees have shown that they're willing to trade for a rental. They're about to trade for oh, no doubt about it. And Scooter Jeanette is a free agent in 2020. Correct. No, no doubt about it. And it, it's going to be... It's going to be fairly interesting to see, and and I remember just about all year when anybody asked me about about the 2019 free agency class and what the Yankees are going to do. All I kept saying was, "This is the hardest off season ever to project because one move is going to lead to countless other moves. It, it just depends on when it happens. We don't know." Um, Paxton was almost a pretty obvious move um, to see made. He's a good starting pitcher. He's a lefty. He can really be powerful and dominating. You pair Corbin up with you pair him up with Corbin. I mean, the Yankees have just went from their best rotation in years. I mean, I, I don't even know on paper what rotation compares to that from the Yankees over the last multiple years. I don't think they have one. So let's see if it the, puts yeah. the Yankees in a better position. Let's see if the Yankees go pitching crazy. Let's see if they get a Corbin, and let's see if the Japanese pitcher post as well. Do you have CC compete for a spot on the rotation, or the Yankees just stack up their rotation with pitchers? <laughs> You know, I, I think at that point they would they would definitely lean a lot more towards the idea of adding bullpen arms than anything else. I know a lot of people talk about like a six man rotation or putting Sabathia in the pen. I just I don't see the Yankees doing that. I mean they they got this they got a love for CC Sabathia, and I think what it is this year is that basically what CC looked at you last year. You know, take a little off the salary. I'll accept eight you make million, no problem. Let's get you back. If CC Sabathia pitched the two months for the Yankees and that's it, I don't think anybody cares. And I'm just being honest. I think if CC Sabathia got his three thousand strikeout and he ended up not pitching the remainder of the year, was injured after you know twelve starts. Not, I'm not saying I hope that happens. I'm just saying in general, that's the kind of I think um, uh, the ability he has towards what this rotation could be. He's kind of that that little secondary piece at the end. Keep him as the fifth guy. If he's replaceable, he's replaceable. He's not going to so, hurt us if he is. So let's go back to Mike Messina and how he's not a Hall of Famer. Okay. Mike Messina ended off his career with a bang, finally winning 20 games. Here's the difference between Messina and Sabathia. Sabathia is considered a Hall of Famer as well. But Mike Messina won 20 games, and then he retired. So comparing oh, well, those two pitchers, maybe. who do you think was the better pitcher, Messina or Sabathia? Oh, it's not even close. I mean, I'm just being honest. It's not even close. Mike Messina by far. Exactly. I mean, by, by far. I mean, even if you could go as far as saying even Andy Pettit, I think, is on. Andy Pettit's more the trajectory of CC Sabathia. Mike Messina, it's not even close. Let, let's, let's, yeah. for, let's not forget here. Mike Messina pitched his entire re- a career in the American League in East. The stereo, small era as well. In the steroid era. And dominated. He wasn't a four ERA guy. And he wasn't even bulky Mike either. He, he didn't even work out either. He didn't look bulky either. He ate peanut no, butter and Mike, jelly Mike sandwiches. Was, yeah, he was he was in the mold of of a Greg Maddox. They were they were in the same type of body frame. They were smaller, scrawny looking. So how the guys. hell is not is Mike Machina not a Hall of Famer? That's just ridiculous. When you're comparing him to Sabathia, well, who was borderline Hall of Fame, and he's pitching at what thirty eight, thirty nine, and Mike Machina just went off with a bang. Just compare that. Well, the thing that cracks me up more than anything is that 
Then you have these geniuses, the same guys who vote for these guys are the same guys that push analytics. And analytics favor guys like Mike Mussina. They favor guys like David Cohen. But yet these guys aren't in the Hall of Fame. But yet analytics love them. So Just to me, that, that whole argument with analytics makes no sense because you're right. Guys like Mike Mussina deserve to be in the Hall of Fame. David Cohn deserves to be in the Hall of Fame. Andy Pettit deserves to be in the Hall of Fame. But you probably will see these guys continue Based to struggle. Based off of Andy Pettit's uh, uh, postseason numbers, he should be automatically in the Hall of Fame. Yeah, Andy Pettit, no question, is to me is to me a Hall of Famer. I mean, he just is. And and again, you look at so many different things. You know, you hear a lot about, well, if Mike Trout retired today, he's a Hall of Famer. And if this guy retired early, they would be a Hall of Famer. I feel the Hall of Fame should be this. If you dominated in your generation, you should be a Hall of Famer. And and you don't get that a lot. Like a guy like Ron Guidry. Ron Guidry pitched a short time, but he dominated for a very short time. Guy should be considered in the Hall of Fame. It's not my fault that I came up late, or maybe I only pitched five or six years in the major leagues. I mean, to me, that should be some sort of limit. Like if you look at if you look at Don Mattingly, if Don Mattingly didn't play those last couple of years injured, he's a first ballot Hall of Famer. But he played a couple of years injured with a bad back, and now he doesn't get in. I mean, it's odd because every baseball writer knows Don Mattingly wasn't healthy. Everybody knows that. that's a known fact. But he doesn't get in because of the last couple of years he struggled. So the Hall of Fame is odd to me. These same baseball writers that push analytics don't put guys in based off analytics. Makes no sense. Yep, and in these closing segments, what do you, where do you think um, Sonny Gray's landing? Um, do you think um, what I think that he's being put in the package for like a, let's say, a semi-blockbuster, you know, like a Scooter Jeanette or whatever? Or do you think the Yankees are just going to trade him for uh, prospects? Uh, no, I think this deal is going to continue to be bigger than what everybody thinks it's going to be. And the reason I say that is, one, more and more suitors are lining up. The Yankees have not jumped the gun on the deal. There's a reason behind that, because suitors are lining up. And there's still a lot of free agents starting pitchers. The Yankees are in a rush to do this deal. I tell people that all the time. People want this guy traded, like, now. Why? You know, let your Corbin get signed. Let, let Eovaldi get signed. What if Eovaldi and Hap are off the table and Corbin's still out there and the assumption is he's going to go to the Yankees or Phillies? All those other teams that need a starting pitcher see that Sonny Gray's available. They're offering you more now. And right. if the Yankees possibly package him with somebody else, yeah, I could see like a Jeanette happening. Or I could see other deals. But still right now, it looks like Cincinnati, Oakland, the Brewers, Braves, those teams make a lot of sense because they still have prospects that can really impact the Yankees now. And they need them. They could really Honestly, use them. So if I'm Oakland, it'll make sense. Exactly. Honestly, if I'm Oakland, you won 95 games. Adding another picture is just not going to hurt. So for me, no, not him, at all. And going back not to Oakland makes the most sense to me. And I mean, you look at the Brewers, you look at the Braves. Those are teams that were in the playoffs that that can add that extra arm. That's going to pitch a lot better. I guarantee you, he goes to the Braves or Brewers. He's back to a mid three ERA guy all year. Exactly. I just think he'll dominate more in the National League. I think he'll be like one I, of those. I, uh, I think so. Tom Glavin type pitchers in the National League. He would likely be a top candidate for comeback player of the year. No question. So in these closing segments, Peter Seminati, the Seminati source, what do you want to add here? Um, nothing much really other than that. I mean, we I feel like we covered everything. Um, this week, look for the Yankees to make a couple of smaller deals or do some uh, designated for assignments on some guys. You know, Ronald Torres, Luis Sessa, Tommy Canely, uh, A.J. Cole, a couple of these guys do need to probably clear up some space on the 40-man um, but I could see some of those guys being moved. I know Sessa has drawn interest. Kingley has drawn interest. So I wouldn't be shocked to see a couple of minor trades, maybe one uh, one little bigger one. Very possible. But I would expect that by Friday. So this has been the 780 source of the 780 source. I mean, Peter 780 of the 780 <laughs> source. Uh, nice having you on, bro. All right, man. I'll talk to you later. All right, take it easy. I'll talk to you later. All right, take it easy. I'll talk to you later. All right, take it easy. I'll talk to you later. All right, take it easy.